Chapter Six of the Count of Monte Cristo. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Art Leung. The Count of Monte Cristo by Alexander Dumas. Chapter Six. The Deputy Procureur du Roi. In one of the aristocratic mansions built by Puget in the Rue du Grand Cour, opposite the Medusa Fountain, a second marriage feast was being celebrated almost at the same hour with the same nuptial repast given by Dantes. In this case, however, although the occasion of the entertainment was similar, the company was strikingly dissimilar. Instead of a rude mixture of sailors, soldiers, and those belonging to the humblest grade of life, the present assembly was composed of the very flower of Marseilles society. Magistrates who had resigned their office during the usurper's reign, officers who had deserted from the imperial army and joined forces with Condé, and younger members of families brought up to hate and execrate the man whom five years of exile would convert into a martyr, and fifteen of restoration elevate to the rank of a god. The guests were still at table, and the heated and energetic conversation that prevailed betrayed the violent and vindictive passions that then agitated each dweller of the South, where unhappily, for five centuries, religious strife had long given increased bitterness to the violence of party feeling. The emperor, now king of the petty island of Elba, after having held sovereign sway over one half of the world, counting as his subjects a small population of five or six thousand souls, after having been accustomed to hear the vive napoleons of a hundred and twenty millions of human beings uttered in ten different languages was looked upon here as a ruined man separated forever from any fresh connection with france or claim to her throne the magistrates freely discussed their political views the military part of the company talked unreservedly of moscow and leipzig while the women commented on the divorce of josephine it was not over the downfall of the man, but over the defeat of the Napoleonic idea that they rejoiced, and in this they foresaw for themselves the bright and cheering prospect of a revivified political existence. An old man decorated with the cross of St. Louis now rose and proposed the health of King Louis the Eighteenth. It was the Marquis de St. Morin. This toast, recalling at once the patient exile of Hartwell and the peace-loving King of France, excited universal enthusiasm glasses were elevated in the air a l'anglaise and the ladies snatching their bouquets from their fair bosoms strewed the table with their floral treasures in a word an almost poetical fervor prevailed ah said the marquise de saint Moran, a woman with a stern forbidding eye though still noble and distinguished in appearance despite her fifty years ah these revolutionists who have driven us from those very possessions they afterwards purchased for a mere trifle during the reign of terror would be compelled to own were they here that all true devotion was on our side since we were content to follow the fortunes of a falling monarch while they on the contrary made their fortune by worshipping the rising sun yes yes they could not help admitting that the king for whom we sacrificed rank wealth and station was truly our louis the well-beloved while their wretched usurper has been and ever will be to them their evil genius their napoleon the accursed am i not right villefort i beg your pardon madame i really must pray you to excuse me but in truth i was not attending to the conversation marquise marquise interposed the old nobleman who had proposed the toast let the young people alone let me tell you on one's wedding day there are more agreeable subjects of conversation than dry politics never mind dearest mother said a young and lovely girl with a profusion of light brown hair and eyes that seemed to float in liquid crystal tis all my fault for seizing upon m de villefort so as to prevent his listening to what you said but there take him now he is your own for as long as you like monsieur de villefort i beg to remind you my mother speaks to you if the marquise will deign to repeat the words i but imperfectly caught i shall be delighted to answer said monsieur de villefort never mind rene replied the marquise with a look of tenderness that seemed out of keeping with her harsh dry features but however all other feelings may be withered in a woman's nature 
there is always one bright smiling spot in the desert of her heart and that is the shrine of maternal love i forgive you what i was saying villefort was the bonapartist had not our sincerity enthusiasm or devotion they had however what supplied the place of those fine qualities replied the young man and that was fanaticism napoleon is the mahomet of the west and is worshipped by his commonplace but ambitious followers not only as a leader and lawgiver but also as the personification of equality he cried the marquise napoleon the type of equality for mercy's sake then what would you call robespierre come come do not strip the latter of his just rights to bestow them on the corsican who to my mind has usurped quite enough nay madame i would place each of these heroes on his right pedestal that of robespierre on his scaffold in the place louis quinze that of napoleon on the column of the place vendome the only difference consists in the opposite character of the equality advocated by these two men one is the equality that elevates the other is the equality that degrades one brings a king within reach of the guillotine the other elevates the people to a level with the throne observe said villefort smiling i do not mean to deny that both these men were revolutionary scoundrels and that the ninth thermidor and the fourth of april in the year eighteen fourteen were lucky days for france worthy of being gratefully remembered by every friend to monarchy and civil order and that explains how it comes to pass that fallen as i trust he is forever napoleon has still retained a train of parasitical satellites still marquise it has been so with other usurpers cromwell for instance who was not half so bad as napoleon had his partisans and advocates do you know villefort that you are talking in a most dreadfully revolutionary strain but i excuse it it is impossible to expect the son of a gerardin to be free of a small spice of the old leaven a deep crimson suffused the countenance of villefort tis true madame answered he that my father was a gerardin but he was not among the number of those who voted for the king's death he was an equal sufferer with yourself during the reign of terror and had well nigh lost his head on the same scaffold on which your father perished true replied the marquise without wincing in the slightest degree at the tragic remembrance thus called up but bear in mind if you please that our respective parents underwent persecution and prescription from diametrically opposite principles in proof of which i may remark that while my family remained among the staunchest adherents of the exiled princes your father lost no time in joining the new government and that while the citizen nortier was a gerardin the count nortier became a senator dear mother interposed renee you know very well it was agreed that all these disagreeable reminiscences should forever be laid aside suffer me also madame replied villefort to add my earnest request to mademoiselle de saint marance that you will kindly allow the veil of oblivion to cover and conceal the past what avails recrimination over matters wholly past recall for my own part i have laid aside even the name of my father and altogether disown his political principles he was nay probably may still be a bonapartist and is called nortier i on the contrary am a staunch royalist and style myself de villefort let what may remain of revolutionary sap exhaust itself and die away with the old trunk and condescend only to regard the young shoot which has started up at a distance from the parent tree without having the power any more than the wish to separate entirely from the stock from which it sprung bravo villefort cried the marquis excellently well said come now i have hopes of obtaining what i have been for years endeavouring to persuade the marquise to promise namely a perfect amnesty and forgetfulness of the past with all my heart replied the marquise let the past be forever forgotten i promise you it affords me as little pleasure to revive it as it does you all i ask is that villefort will be firm and inflexible for the future in his political principles remember also villefort that we have pledged ourselves to his majesty for your fealty and strict loyalty and that at our recommendation the king consented to forget the past as i do and here she extended to him her hand as i now do at your entreaty but bear in mind that should there fall in your way any one guilty of conspiring against the government 
you will be so much more bound to visit the offence with rigorous punishment, as it is known you belong to a suspected family. Alas, madame, returned Villefort, my profession, as well as the times in which we live, compels me to be severe. I have already successfully conducted several public prosecutions, and brought the offenders to merited punishment. But we have not done with the thing yet. Do you indeed think so? inquired the Marquise. I am at least fearful of it. Napoleon, in the island of Elba, is too near France, and his proximity keeps up the hopes of his partisans. Marseilles is filled with half-pay officers, who are daily, under one frivolous pretext or other, getting up quarrels with the royalist. From hence arise continual and fatal duels among the higher classes of persons, and assassinations in the lower. "'You have heard, perhaps,' said the Comte de Savio, one of Monsieur de saint Meran's oldest friends, and Chamberlain to the Comte d'Artois, "'that the Holy Alliance propose removing him from thence.' "'Yes, they were talking about it when we left Paris,' said Monsieur de saint Meran. "'And where is it decided to transfer him?' "'To St. Helena.' "'For heaven's sake, where is that?' asked the Marquise. "'An island situated on the other side of the equator, at least two thousand leagues from here,' replied the Count. "'So much the better, as Villefort observes. It is a great act of folly to have left such a man between Corsica, where he was born, and Naples, of which his brother-in-law is king, and face to face with Italy, the sovereignty of which he coveted for his son.' "'Unfortunately,' said Villefort, there are the treaties of 1814, and we cannot molest Napoleon without breaking those compacts. Oh, well, we shall find some way out of it, responded Monsieur de Savio. There wasn't any trouble over treaties when it was a question of shooting the poor Duc d'Angleterre. Well, said the Marquise, it seems probable that, by the aid of the Holy Alliance, we shall be rid of Napoleon and we must trust to the vigilance of Monsieur de Villefort to purify Marseilles of his partisans. The king is either a king or no king. If he be acknowledged as sovereign of France, he should be upheld in peace and tranquillity, and this can best be effected by employing the most inflexible agents to put down every attempt at conspiracy. Tis the best and surest means of preventing mischief. Unfortunately, madame, answered Villefort, the strong arm of the law is not called upon to interfere until the evil has taken place. Then all he has got to do is to endeavor to repair it. Nay, madame, the law is frequently powerless to effect this. All it can do is to avenge the wrong done. Oh, Monsieur de Villefort, cried a beautiful young creature, daughter to the Comte de Sauvio, and the cherished friend of Mademoiselle de saint Meran, do try and get up some famous trial while we are at Marseilles. I never was in a law court, and I am told it is so very amusing. Amusing, certainly, replied the young man, inasmuch as, instead of shedding tears as at the fictitious tale of woe produced at a theatre, you behold in a law court a case of real and genuine distress, a drama of life. The prisoner, whom you there see pale, agitated, and alarmed, instead of, as is the case when a curtain falls on a tragedy, going home to sup peacefully with his family, and then retiring to rest, that he may recommence his mimic woes on the morrow, is removed from your sight merely to be reconducted to his prison, and delivered up to the executioner. I leave you to judge how far your nerves are calculated to bear you through such a scene. Of this, however, be assured, that should any favorable opportunity present itself, I will not fail to offer you the choice of being present. "'For shame, Monsieur de Villefort!' cried René, becoming quite pale. "'Don't you see how you are frightening us? And yet you laugh!' "'What would you have? Tis like a duel. I have already recorded sentence of death five or six times against the movers of political conspiracies, and who can say how many daggers may be ready sharpened and only waiting a favorable opportunity to be buried in my heart?' "'Gracious heavens, Monsieur de Villefort!' said René, becoming more and more terrified. You surely are not in earnest. Indeed I am, replied the young magistrate with a smile. And in the interesting trial that young lady is anxious to witness, the case would only be still more aggravated. Suppose, for instance, the prisoner, as is more than probable, to have served under Napoleon, 
well can you expect for an instant that one accustomed at the word of his commander to rush fearlessly on the very bayonet of his foe will scruple more to drive a stiletto into the heart of one he knows to be his personal enemy than to slaughter his fellow-creatures merely because bidden to do so by one he is bound to obey besides one requires the excitement of being hateful in the eyes of the accused in order to lash one's self into a state of sufficient vehemence and power i would not choose to see the man against whom i pleaded smile as though in mockery of my words no my pride is to see the accused pale agitated and as though beaten out of all composure by the fire of my eloquence rene uttered a smothered exclamation bravo cried one of the guests that is what i call talking to some purpose just the person we require at a time like the present said a second what a splendid business that last case of yours was my dear villefort remarked a third i mean the trial of the man for murdering his father upon my word you killed him ere the executioner had laid his hand upon him oh as for parricides and such dreadful people as that interposed renee it matters very little what is done to them but as regards poor unfortunate creatures whose only crime consists of having mixed themselves up in political intrigues why that is the very worst offence they could possibly commit for don't you see rene the king is the father of his people and he who shall plot or contrive aught against the life and safety of the parent of thirty-two millions of souls is a parasite upon a fearfully great scale i don't know anything about that replied rene but monsieur de villefort you have promised me have you not always to show mercy to those i plead for make yourself quite easy on that point answered villefort with one of his sweetest smiles you and i will always consult upon our verdicts my love said the marquise attend to your doves your lap-dogs and embroidery but do not meddle with what you do not understand nowadays the military profession is in abeyance and the magisterial robe is the badge of honour there is a wise latin proverb that is very much in point sedant arma togai said villefort with a bow i cannot speak latin replied the marquise well said rene i cannot help regretting you had not chosen some other profession than your own a physician for instance do you know i always felt a shudder at the idea of even a destroying angel dear good rene whispered villefort as he gazed with unutterable tenderness on the lovely speaker let us hope my child cried the marquis that m de villefort may prove the moral and political physician of this province if so he will have achieved a noble work and one which will go far to efface the recollection of his father's conduct added the incorrigible marquise madame replied villefort with a mournful smile i have already had the honour to observe that my father has at least i hope so abjured his past errors and that he is at the present moment a firm and zealous friend to religion and order a better royalist possibly than his son for he has to atone for past dereliction while i have no other impulse than warm decided preference and conviction having made this well-turned speech villefort looked carefully around to mark the effect of his oratory much as he would have done had he been addressing the bench in open court do you know my dear villefort cried the comte de salvio that is exactly what i myself said the other day at the tuileries when questioned by his majesty's principal chamberlain touching the singularity of an alliance between the son of a gerodin and the daughter of an officer of the duc de conde and i assure you he seemed fully to comprehend that this mode of reconciling political differences was based upon sound and excellent principles then the king who without our suspecting it had overheard our conversation interrupted us by saying villefort observe that the king did not pronounce the word nortier but on the contrary placed considerable emphasis on that of villefort villefort said his majesty is a young man of great judgment and discretion who will be sure to make a figure in his profession i like him much and it gave me great pleasure to hear that he was about to become the son-in-law of the marquis and marquise de saint Maron. i should myself have recommended the match had not the noble marquis anticipated my wishes by requesting my consent to it is it possible that the king could have condescended so far as to express himself so favourably of me 
asked the enraptured Villefort. "'I give you his very words. And if the Marquis chooses to be candid, he will confess that they perfectly agree with what His Majesty said to him, when he went six months ago to consult him upon the subject of your espousing his daughter.' "'That is true,' answered the Marquis. "'How much do I owe this gracious prince? What is there I would not do to evince my earnest gratitude?' "'That is right,' cried the Marquise. "'I love to see you thus. "'Now, then, were a conspirator to fall into your hands, "'he would be most welcome.' "'For my part, dear mother,' interposed René, "'I trust your wishes will not prosper, "'and that Providence will only permit petty offenders, "'poor debtors, and miserable cheats "'to fall into Monsieur de Villefort's hands. "'Then I shall be contented.' just the same as though you prayed that a physician might only be called upon to prescribe for headaches measles and the stings of wasps or any other slight affection of the epidermis if you wish to see me the king's attorney you must desire for me some of those violent and dangerous diseases from the cure of which so much honor redounds to the physician at this moment and as though the utterance of villefort's wish had sufficed to effect its accomplishment a servant entered the room and whispered a few words in his ear. Villefort immediately rose from the table and quitted the room upon the plea of urgent business. He soon, however, returned, his whole face beaming with delight. René regarded him with fond affection, and certainly his handsome features, lit up as they then were with more than usual fire and animation, seemed formed to excite the innocent admiration with which she gazed on her graceful and intelligent lover. "'You were wishing just now,' said Villefort, addressing her, "'that I were a doctor instead of a lawyer. "'Well, I at least resemble the disciples of Aesculapius in one thing, "'that of not being able to call a day my own, "'not even that of my betrothal.' "'And wherefore were you called away just now?' "'asked Mademoiselle de saint Meran with an air of deep interest. "'For a very serious matter, "'which bids fair to make work for the executioner.' "'How dreadful!' exclaimed Renée, turning pale. "'Is it possible?' burst simultaneously from all who were near enough to the magistrate to hear his words. "'Why, if my information prove correct, a sort of Bonaparte conspiracy has just been discovered.' "'Can I believe my ears?' cried the Marquise. "'I will read you the letter containing the accusation, at least,' said Villefort. "'The king's attorney is informed by a friend to the throne and the religious institutions of his country, that one named Edmond Dantes, mate of the ship Farion, this day arrived from Smyrna, after having touched at Naples and Porto Ferrajo, has been the bearer of a letter from Marat to the usurper, and again taken charge of another letter from the usurper to the Bonapartist Club in Paris. Ample corroboration of this statement may be obtained by arresting the above-mentioned Edmond Dantes, who either carries the letter for Paris about with him, or has it at his father's abode. Should it not be found in the possession of father or son, then it will assuredly be discovered in the cabin belonging to the said Dantes on board the Farion. But, said René, this letter, which, after all, is but an anonymous scrawl, is not even addressed to you, but to the king's attorney. True, but that gentleman, being absent, his secretary, by his orders, opened his letters, thinking this one of importance he sent for me, but not finding me took upon himself to give the necessary orders for arresting the accused party. "'Then the guilty person is absolutely in custody?' said the Marquise. "'Nay, dear mother, say the accused person. You know we cannot yet pronounce him guilty.' "'He is in safe custody,' answered Beaufort, "'and rely upon it, if the letter is found, he will not be likely to be trusted abroad again.' unless he goes forth under the especial protection of the headsman. "'And where is the unfortunate being?' asked René. "'He is at my house.' "'Come, come, my friend,' interrupted the Marquise. "'Do not neglect your duty to linger with us. You are the king's servant, and must go wherever that service calls you.' "'Oh, Villefort,' cried René, clasping her hands and looking towards her lover with piteous earnestness, "'be merciful on this day of our betrothal.' The young man passed round to the side of the table where the fair pleader sat, and, leaning over her chair, said tenderly, "'To give you pleasure, my sweet Renée, I promise to show all the lenity in my power. 
but if the charges brought against this bonapartist hero prove correct why then you really must give me leave to order his head to be cut off rene shuddered never mind that foolish girl villefort said the marquise she will soon get over these things so saying madame de saint Maron extended her dry bony hand to villefort who while imprinting a son-in-law's respectful salute on it looked at rene as much as to say i must try and fancy tis your dear hand i kiss as it should have been these are mournful auspices to accompany a betrothal sighed poor rene upon my word child exclaimed the angry marquise your folly exceeds all bounds i should be glad to know what connection there can possibly be between your sickly sentimentality and the affairs of the state oh mother murmured rene nay madame i pray you pardon this little traitor i promise you that to make up for her want of loyalty i will be most inflexibly severe then casting an expressive glance at his betrothed which seemed to say fear not for your dear sake my justice shall be tempered with mercy and receiving a sweet and approving smile in return villefort quitted the room End of chapter six chapter seven of the count of monte cristo this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox Recording by Grace Garrett. The Count of Monte Cristo by Alexandre Dumas. Chapter Seven. The Examination. No sooner had Villefort left the salon than he assumed the grave air of a man who holds the balance of life and death in his hands. Now, in spite of the nobility of his countenance, the command of which, like a finished actor, he had carefully studied before the glass, it was by no means easy for him to assume an air of judicial severity except the recollection of the line of politics his father had adopted and which might interfere unless he acted with the greatest prudence with his own career gerard de villefort was as happy as a man could be already rich he held a high official situation though only twenty-seven he was about to marry a young and charming woman whom he loved not passionately but reasonably as became a duty attorney of the king and besides her personal attractions which were very great mademoiselle de st Maron's family possessed considerable political influence which they would of course exert in his favour the dowry of his wife amounted to fifty thousand crowns and he had besides the prospect of seeing her fortune increased to half a million at her father's death these considerations naturally gave villefort a feeling of such complete felicity that his mind was fairly dazzled in its contemplation at the door he met the commissionary of police who was waiting for him the sight of this officer recalled villefort from the third heaven to earth he composed his face as we have before described and said i have read the letter sir and you have acted rightly in arresting this man now inform me what you have discovered concerning him and the conspiracy we know nothing as yet of the conspiracy monsieur the papers found have been sealed up and placed on your desk the prisoner himself is named edmond dantes mate on board the three master the pharaon trading in cotton with alexandria and smyrna and belonging to morel and son of marseilles before he entered the merchant service had he ever served in the marines oh no monsieur he is very young how old nineteen or twenty at most at this moment and as villefort had arrived at the corner of the rue des conseils a man who seemed to have been waiting for him approached it was monsieur morel ah monsieur villefort cried he i am delighted to see you some of your people have committed the strangest mistake they have just arrested edmond dantes mate of my vessel i know it monsieur replied villefort i am going now to examine him oh said monsieur morel carried away by his friendship you do not know him and i do he is most estimable the most trustworthy creature in the world and i will venture to say there is not a better seaman in all the merchant service oh monsieur de villefort i beseech your indulgence for him villefort as we have seen belonged to the aristocratic party at marseilles morel to the plebeian the first was a royalist the other suspected of bonapartism villefort looked disdainfully at morel and replied you are aware monsieur that a man may be estimable and trustworthy in private life and the best seaman in the merchant service 
and yet be, politically speaking, a great criminal, is it not true? The magistrate laid emphasis on these words, as if he wished to apply them to the owner himself, while his eyes seemed to plunge into the heart of one who, interceding for another, had himself need of indulgence. Morel reddened, for his own conscience was not quite clear on politics. Besides, what Dantes had told him of his interview with the Grand Marshal, and what the Emperor had said to him, embarrassed him. He replied, however, "'I entreat you, Monsieur de Villefort, be as you always are, kind and equitable, and give him back to us soon.' This give us sounded revolutionary in the deputy's ears. "'Ah, ah,' murmured he, "'is Dantes, then, a member of some carbonari society, that his protector thus employs the collective form?' He was, if I recollect, arrested in a tavern, in company with a great many others. Then he added, Monsieur, you may rest assured I will perform my duty impartially, and that if he be innocent you shall not have appealed to me in vain. Should he, however, be guilty, in this present epoch impunity would furnish a dangerous example, and I must do my duty. As he had now arrived at the door of his own house, which adjourned to the Palais de Justice, he entered, after having coldly saluted the shipowner, who stood as if petrified on the spot where Villefort had left him. The antechamber was full of police agents and gendarmes, in the midst of whom, carefully watched, but calm and smiling, stood the prisoner. Villefort traversed the antechamber, cast a side glance at Dantes, and taking a packet which a gendarme offered him, disappeared, saying, "'Bring in the prisoner.' Rapid as had been Villefort's glance, it had served to give him an idea of the man he was about to interrogate. He had recognized intelligence in the high forehead, courage in the dark eyes and bent brow, and frankness in the thick lips that showed a set of pearly teeth. Villefort's first impression was favorable, but he had been so often warned to mistrust first impulses that he applied the maxim to the impression, forgetting the difference between the two words. He stifled, therefore, the feelings of compassion that were rising, composed his features, and sat down, grim and sombre, at his desk. An instant after, Dantes entered. He was pale, but calm and collected, and, saluting his judge with easy politeness, looked around for a seat, as if he had been in Monsieur Morel's salon. It was then that he encountered, for the first time, Villefort's look, that look peculiar to the magistrate, who, while seeming to read the thoughts of others, betrays nothing of his own. "'Who and what are you?' demanded Villefort, turning over a pile of papers, containing information relative to the prisoner, that a police agent had given to him on his entry, and that, already in an hour's time, had swelled to voluminous proportions, thanks to the corrupt espionage of which the accused is always made the victim. "'My name is Edmond Dantes,' replied the young man calmly. "'I am a mate of the Pharaon, belonging to Messrs. Morel and Son.' "'Your age?' continued Villefort. Nineteen, returned Dantes. "'What were you doing at the moment you were arrested?' "'I was at the festival of my marriage, monsieur,' said the young man, his voice slightly tremulous, so great was the contrast between that happy moment and the painful ceremony he was now undergoing. So great was the contrast between the sombre aspect of Monsieur de Villefort and the radiant face of Mercedes. "'You were at the festival of your marriage,' said the deputy." shuddering in spite of himself. "'Yes, monsieur. I am on the point of marrying a young girl I have been attached to for three years.' Villefort, impassive as he was, was struck by this coincidence, and the tremulous voice of Dantes, surprised in the midst of his happiness, struck a sympathetic chord in his own bosom. He also was at the point of being married, and he was summoned from his own happiness to destroy that of another. "'This philosophic reflection,' thought he, will make a great sensation at Monsieur de Semarans, and he arranged mentally, while Dantes awaited further questions, the antithesis by which orators often create a reputation for eloquence. When this speech was arranged, Villefort turned to Dantes. "'Go on, sir,' said he. "'What would you have me say?' "'Give all the information in your power. Tell me on which point you desire information, and I will tell all I know. Only,' he added with a smile, I warn you I know very little. Have you served under the usurper? I was about to be mustered into the Royal Marines when he fell. It is reported your political opinions are extreme, said Villefort, who had never heard anything of the kind, but was not sorry to make this inquiry, as if it were an accusation. 
my political opinions replied dantes alas sir i never had any opinions i am hardly nineteen i know nothing i have no part to play if i obtain the situation i desire i shall owe it to monsieur morel thus all my opinions i will not say public but private are confined to these three sentiments i love my father i respect monsieur morel and i adore mercedes this sir is all i can tell you and you see how uninteresting it is as dantes spoke villefort gazed at his ingenuous and open countenance and recollected the words of rene who without knowing who the culprit was had besought his indulgence for him with the deputy's knowledge of crime and criminals every word the young man uttered convinced him more and more of his innocence this lad for he was scarcely a man simple natural eloquent with that eloquence of the heart never found when sought for full of affection for everybody because he was happy and because happiness renders even the wicked good extended his affection even to his judge spite of villefort's severe look and stern accent dantes seemed full of kindness pardieu said villefort he is a noble fellow i hope i shall gain renee's favour easily by obeying the first command she ever imposed on me i shall have at least a pressure of the hand in public and a sweet kiss in private full of this idea villefort's face became so joyous that when he turned to dantes the latter who had watched the change in his physiognomy was smiling also sir said villefort have you any enemies at least that you know of i have enemies replied dantes my position is not sufficiently elevated for that as for my disposition that is perhaps somewhat too hasty but i have striven to repress it i have had ten or twelve sailors under me and if you question them they will tell you that they love and respect me not as a father for i am too young but as an elder brother but you may have excited jealousy you are about to become captain at nineteen an elevated post you are about to marry a pretty girl who loves you and these two pieces of good fortune may have excited the envy of some you are right you know men better than i do and what you say may possibly be the case i confess but if such persons are among my acquaintance i prefer not to know it because then i should be forced to hate them you are wrong you should always strive to see clearly around you you seem a worthy young man i will depart from the strict line of my duty to aid you in discovering the author of this accusation here is the paper do you know the writing as he spoke villefort drew the letter from his pocket and presented it to dantes dantes read it a cloud passed over his brow as he said no monsieur i do not know the writing and yet it is tolerably plain whoever did it writes well i am very fortunate added he looking gratefully at villefort to be examined by such a man as you for this envious person is a real enemy and by the rapid glance that the young man's eyes shot forth villefort saw how much energy lay hid beneath this mildness now said the deputy answer me frankly not as a prisoner to a judge but as one man to another who takes an interest in him what truth is there in the accusation contained in this anonymous letter and villefort threw disdainfully on his desk the letter dantes had just given back to him none at all i will tell you the real facts i swear by my honour as a sailor by my love for mercedes by the life of my father speak monsieur said villefort then internally if renee could see me i hope she would be satisfied and no longer call me a decapitator well when we quitted naples captain leclerc was attacked with a brain fever as we had no doctor on board and he was so anxious to arrive at elba that he would not touch at any other port his disorder rose to such a height that at the end of the third day feeling he was dying he called me to him my dear dantes said he swear to perform what i am going to tell you for it is a matter of the deepest importance i swear captain replied i well as after my death the command devolves on you as mate assume the command and bear up for the island of elba disembark at port of Rajo, ask for the grand marshal give him this letter perhaps they will give you another letter and charge you with a commission you will accomplish what i was to have done and derive all the honour and profit from it i will do it captain but perhaps i shall not be admitted to the grand marshal's presence as easily as you expect here is a ring that will obtain an audience of him and remove every difficulty said the captain at these words he gave me a ring it was time two hours after he was delirious 
The next day he died. And what did you do then? What I ought to have done, and what every one would have done in my place. Everywhere the last requests of a dying man are sacred, but with a sailor the last requests of a superior are commands. I sailed for the island of Elba, where I arrived the next day. I ordered everybody to remain on board, and went on shore alone. As I had expected, I found some difficulty in obtaining access to the Grand Marshal. But I sent the ring I had received from the captain to him, and was instantly admitted. He questioned me concerning Captain Leclerc's death, and, as the latter had told me, gave me a letter to carry on to a person in Paris. I undertook it, because it was what my captain had bade me do. I landed here, regulated the affairs of the vessel, and hastened to visit my affianced bride, whom I found more lovely than ever. Thanks to Monsieur Morel all the forms were got over. In a word, I was, as I told you, at my marriage feast, and should have been married in an hour. And to-morrow I intended to start for Paris, had I not been arrested on this charge, which you as well as I now see to be unjust. Ah, said Villefort, this seems to me the truth. If you have been culpable, it was imprudence, and this imprudence was in obedience to the orders of your captain. Give up this letter you have brought from Elba, and pass your word you will appear should you be required, and go and rejoin your friends. I am free then, sir, cried Dantes joyfully. Yes, but first give me this letter. You have it already, for it was taken from me with some others, which I see in that packet. Stop a moment, said the deputy, as Dantes took his hat and gloves. To whom is it addressed? to Monsieur Noitier, Rue Coqueron, Paris. Had a thunderbolt fallen into the room, Villefort could not have been more stupefied. He sank into his seat, and hastily turning over the packet, drew forth the fatal letter, at which he glanced with an expression of terror. Monsieur Noitier, Rue Coqueron, number 13, murmured he, growing still paler. Yes, said Dantes. Do you know him? No, replied Villefort. A faithful servant of the king does not know conspirators. It is a conspiracy, then? asked Dantes, who, after believing himself free, now began to feel a tenfold alarm. I have, however, already told you, sir, I was entirely ignorant of the contents of the letter. Yes, but you knew the name of the person to whom it was addressed, said Villefort. I was forced to read the address to know whom to give it. "'Have you shown this letter to any one?' asked Villefort, becoming still more pale. "'To no one, on my honour. Everybody is ignorant that you are the bearer of a letter from the island of Elba, and addressed to Monsieur Noitier. Everybody except the person who gave it to me.' "'And that is too much, far too much,' murmured Villefort. Villefort's brow darkened more and more, his white lips and clinched teeth, filled Dantes with apprehension. After reading the letter, Villefort covered his face with his hands. "'Oh,' said Dantes timidly, "'what is the matter?' Villefort made no answer, but raised his head at the expiration of a few seconds, and again perused the letter. "'And you say that you are ignorant of the contents of this letter?' "'I give you my word of honour, sir,' said Dantes. "'But what is the matter? You are ill. Shall I ring for assistance?' "'Shall I call?' "'No,' said Villefort, rising hastily. "'Stay where you are. It is for me to give orders here, and not you.' "'Monsieur,' replied Dantes proudly, "'it was only to summon assistance for you.' "'I want none. It was a temporary indisposition. "'Attend to yourself. Answer me.' Dantes waited, expecting a question. But in vain, Villefort fell back on his chair, passed his hand over his brow, moist with perspiration, and for the third time read the letter. "'Oh, if he knows the contents of this,' murmured he, "'and that Noitier is the father of Villefort, I am lost.' And he fixed his eyes upon Edmond, as if he would have penetrated his thoughts. "'Oh, it is impossible to doubt it,' cried he suddenly. "'In heaven's name,' cried the unhappy young man, "'if you doubt me, question me, I will answer you.' Villefort made a violent effort, and in a tone he strove to render firm. "'Sir,' said he, I am no longer able, as I had hoped, to restore you immediately to liberty. Before doing so, I must consult the trial justice. What my own feeling is, you already know. Oh, monsieur, cried Dantes, you have been rather a friend than a judge. Well, 
I must detain you some time longer, but I will strive to make it as short as possible. The principal charge against you is this letter, and you see, Villefort approached the fire, cast it in, and waited until it was entirely consumed. You see, I destroy it. Oh, exclaimed Dantes, you are goodness itself. Listen, continued Villefort, you can now have confidence in me, after what I have done. Oh, command, and I will obey. Listen, this is not a command, but advice I give you. Speak, and I will follow your advice. I shall detain you until this evening in the Palais de Justice. Should anyone else interrogate you, say to him what you have said to me, but do not breathe a word of this letter. I promise. It was Villefort who seemed to entreat, and the prisoner who reassured him. You see, continued he, glancing toward the grate, where fragments of burnt paper fluttered in the flames, the letter is destroyed. You and I alone know of its existence. Should you, therefore, be questioned, deny all knowledge of it, deny it boldly, and you are saved. Be satisfied, I will deny it. It was the only letter you had? It was. Swear it. I swear it. Villefort rang. A police agent entered. Villefort whispered some words in his ears, to which the officer replied by a motion of his head. "'Follow him,' said Villefort to Dantes. Dantes saluted Villefort and retired. Hardly had the door closed, when Villefort threw himself half-fainting into a chair. "'Alas, alas!' murmured he. "'If the procureur himself had been at Marseilles, I should have been ruined. This accursed letter would have destroyed all my hopes. Oh, my father, must your past career always interfere with my success!' Suddenly a light passed over his face, a smile played round his set mouth, and his haggard eyes were fixed in a thought. "'This will do,' said he, "'and from this letter which might have ruined me, I will make my fortune. Now to the work I have in hand.' And after having assured himself that the prisoner was gone, the deputy procureur hastened to the house of his betrothed. End of chapter 7 The Count of Monte Cristo. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Caroline Hammerly Kunkel, Columbus, Ohio. The Count of Monte Cristo by Alexandra Dumas. Chapter 8 The Chateau d'If. The commissary of police, as he traversed the antechamber, made a sign to two gendarmes, who placed themselves one on Dantes' right and the other on his left. A door that communicated with the Palais de Justice was opened, and they went through a long range of gloomy corridors, whose appearance might have made even the boldest shudder. The Palais de Justice communicated with the prison, a somber edifice that from its grated windows looks on the clock tower of the Acule. After numberless windings, Dantes saw a door with an iron wicket, the commissary took up an iron mallet and knocked thrice, every blow seeming to Dantes as if struck on his heart. The door opened, the two gendarmes gently pushed him forward, and the door closed with a loud sound behind him. The air he inhaled was no longer pure, but thick and mephitic. He was in prison. He was conducted to a tolerably neat chamber, but grated and barred, and its appearance, therefore, did not greatly alarm him. Besides, the words of Villefort, who seemed to interest himself so much, resounded still in his ears like a promise of freedom. It was four o'clock when Dantes was placed in this chamber. It was, as we have said, the first of March, and the prisoner was soon buried in darkness. The obscurity augmented the acuteness of his hearing. At the slightest sound he rose and hastened to the door, convinced they were about to liberate him, but the sound died away, and Dantes sank again into his seat. At last, about ten o'clock, and just as Dantes began to despair, steps were heard in the corridor, a key turned in the lock, and the bolts creaked. The massy oaken door flew open, and a flood of light from two torches pervaded the apartment. By the torchlight Dantes saw the glittering saber and carbines of four gendarmes. He had advanced at first, but stopped at the sight of this display of force. "'Are you come to fetch me?' he asked. "'Yes,' replied a gendarme. By the orders of the deputy procurer? I believe so. 
the conviction that they came from monsieur de villefort relieved all dantes's apprehensions he advanced calmly and placed himself in the centre of the escort a carriage waited at the door the coachman was at the box and a police officer sat beside him is this carriage for me said dantes it is for you replied a gendarme dantes was about to speak but feeling himself urged forward and having neither the power nor the intention to resist he mounted the steps and was in an instant seated inside between two gendarmes the two others took their places opposite and the carriage rolled heavily over the stones the prisoner glanced at the windows they were grated he had changed his prison for another that was conveying him he knew not whither through the grating however dantes saw they were passing through the rue Cassierie, and by the rue saint laurent and the rue Teramis to the port soon he saw the lights of la cassagne the carriage stopped the officer descended approached the guardhouse a dozen soldiers came out and formed themselves in order dantes saw the reflection of their muskets by the light of the lamps on the quay can all this force be summoned on my account thought he the officer opened the door which was locked and without speaking a word answered dantes's question for he saw between the ranks of the soldiers a passage formed from the carriage to the port the two gendarmes who were opposite to him descended first then he was ordered to alight and the gendarmes on each side of him followed his example they advanced towards a boat which a custom house officer held by a chain near the quay the soldiers looked at dantes with an air of stupid curiosity in an instant he was placed in the stern sheets of the boat between the gendarmes while the officer stationed himself at the bow a shove sent the boat adrift and four sturdy oarsmen impelled it rapidly toward the pylon at a shout from the boat the chain that closes the mouth of the port was lowered and in a second they were as dantes knew in their friol and outside the inner harbor the prisoner's first feeling was of joy at again breathing the pure air for air is freedom but he soon sighed for he passed before la reserve where he had that morning been so happy and now through the open windows came the laughter and revelry of a ball dantes folded his hands and raised his eyes to the heaven and prayed fervently the boat continued her voyage they had passed the tete de mort were now off the Anse de ferro and about to double the battery this maneuver was incomprehensible to dantes whither are you taking me asked he you will soon know but still we are forbidden to give you any explanation dantes trained in discipline knew that nothing would be more absurd than to question subordinates who were forbidden to reply and so he remained silent the most vague and wild thoughts passed through his mind the boat they were in could not make a long voyage there was no vessel at anchor outside the harbor he thought perhaps they were going to leave him on some distant point he was not bound nor had they made any attempt to handcuff him this seemed a good augury besides had not the deputy who had been so kind to him told him that provided he did not pronounce the dreaded name of nortier he had nothing to apprehend had not villefort in his presence destroyed the fatal letter the only proof against him he waited silently striving to pierce through the darkness they had left the isle rotineux where the lighthouse stood on the right and they were now opposite the point de catalan it seemed to the prisoner that he could distinguish a feminine form on the beach for it was there mercedes dwelt how was it that presentiment did not warn mercedes that her lover was within three hundred yards of her one light alone was visible and dantes saw that it came from mercedes chamber mercedes was the only one awake in the whole settlement a loud cry could be heard by her but pride restrained him and he did not utter it what would his guards think if they heard him shout like a madman he remained silent his eyes fixed upon the light the boat went on but the prisoner thought only of mercedes an intervening elevation of land hid the light dantes turned and perceived that they had got out to sea while he had been absorbed in thought they had shipped their oars and hoisted sail the boat was now moving with the wind in spite of his repugnance to address the guards dantes turned to the nearest gendarme and taking his hand comrade said he i adjure you as a christian and a sailor to tell me where we are going i am captain dantes a loyal frenchman though accused of treason tell me where you are conducting me and i promise you on my honor i will submit to my fate the gendarme looked irresolutely at his companion who returned for answer a sign that said i see no great harm in telling him now and the gendarme replied you are a native of marseilles 
and a sailor, and yet you do not know where you are going? On my honor, I have no idea. Have you no idea whatever? None at all. That is impossible. I swear to you it is true. Tell me, I entreat. But my orders. Your orders do not forbid your telling me what I must know in ten minutes, in half an hour, or an hour. You see I cannot escape, even if I intended. Unless you are blind, or have never been outside the harbor, you must know. I do not. Look round you, then. Dantes rose and looked forward, when he saw rise within a hundred yards of him the black and frowning rock on which stands the Chateau d'If, this gloomy fortress, which has for more than three hundred years furnished food for so many wild legends, seemed to Dantes like a scaffold to a malefactor. The Chateau d'If, cried he, what are we going there for? The gendarme smiled. I am not going there to be imprisoned, said Dantes. It is only used for political prisoners. I have committed no crime. Are there any magistrates or judges at the Chateau d'If? There are only, said the gendarme, a governor, a garrison, turnkeys, and good thick walls. Come, come, do not look so astonished, or you will make me think you are laughing at me in return for my good nature. Dantes pressed the gendarme's hand as though he would crush it. You think, then, said he, that I am taken to the Chateau d'If to be imprisoned there? It is probable, but there is no occasion to squeeze so hard. Without any injury, without any formality? All the formalities have been gone through. The inquiry is already made. And so, in spite of Monsieur de Villefort's promises? I do not know what Monsieur de Villefort promised you, said the gendarme, but I know we are taking you to the Chateau d'If. But what are you doing? Help, comrades, help! By a rapid movement, which the gendarme's practiced eye had perceived, Dantes sprang forward to precipitate himself into the sea. But four vigorous arms seized him as his feet quitted the bottom of the boat. He fell back, cursing with rage. Good, said the gendarme, placing his knee on his chest. Believe soft-spoken gentlemen again. Hark ye, my friend, I have disobeyed my first order, but I will not disobey the second. And if you move, I will blow your brains out. And he leveled his carbine at Dantes, who felt the muzzle against his temple. For a moment the idea of struggling crossed his mind, and of so ending the unexpected evil that had overtaken him. But he bethought him of Monsieur de Villefort's promise, and besides, death in a boat from the hand of a gendarme seemed too terrible. He remained motionless, but gnashing his teeth and wringing his hands with fury. At this moment the boat came to a landing with a violent shock. One of the sailors leaped on shore, and a cord creaked as it ran through a pulley and Dantes guessed they were on the end of the voyage, and that they were mooring the boat. His guards, taking him by the arms and coat-collar, forced him to rise and dragged him towards the steps that lead to the gate of the fortress, while the police officer carrying a musket with fixed bayonet followed behind. Dantes made no resistance. He was like a man in a dream. He saw soldiers drawn up on the embankment. He knew vaguely that he was ascending a flight of steps. He was conscious that he passed through a door, and that the door closed behind him but all this indistinctly as through a mist. He did not even see the ocean, that terrible barrier against freedom, which the prisoners look upon with utter despair. They halted for a minute, during which he strove to collect his thoughts. He looked around. He was in a court surrounded by high walls. He heard the measured tread of sentinels. As they passed through the light, he saw the barrels of their muskets shine. They waited upwards of ten minutes. Certain Dantes could not escape. The gendarmes released him. They seemed awaiting orders. The orders came. "'Where is the prisoner?' said a voice. "'Here,' replied the gendarmes. "'Let him follow me. I will take him to the cell.' "'Go,' said the gendarmes, thrusting Dantes forward. The prisoner followed his guide, who led him into a room almost underground, whose bare and reeking walls seemed as though impregnated with tears. A lamp placed on a stool illumined the apartment faintly, and showed Dantes the features of his conductor, an under-jailer, ill-clothed, and of sullen appearance. "'Here is your chamber for to-night,' said he. "'It is late, and the governor is asleep. "'Tomorrow, perhaps, he may change you. "'In the meantime, there is bread, water, and fresh straw, "'and that is all a prisoner can ask for. "'Good night.' "'And before Dantes could open his mouth, "'before he had noticed where the jailer placed his bread or the water, "'before he had glanced towards the corner where the straw was, "'the jailer disappeared, taking with him the lamp and closing the door.' leaving stamped upon the prisoner's mind the dim reflection of the dripping walls of his dungeon. Dantes was alone in darkness and in silence, cold as the shadows that he felt breathe on his burning forehead. With the first dawn of the day the jailer returned. 
with orders to leave Dantes where he was. He found the prisoner in the same position, as if fixed there, his eyes swollen with weeping. He had passed the night standing and without sleep. The jailer advanced. Dantes appeared not to perceive him. He touched him on the shoulder. Edmund started. "'Have you not slept?' said the jailer. "'I do not know,' replied Dantes. The jailer stared. "'Are you hungry?' continued he. "'I do not know.' "'Do you wish for anything?' "'I wish to see the governor.' The jailer shrugged his shoulders and left the chamber. Dantes followed him with his eyes and stretched forth his hands towards the open door, but the door closed. All his emotion then burst forth. He cast himself on the ground, weeping bitterly and asking himself what crime he had committed that he was thus punished. The day passed thus. He scarcely tasted food, but walked round and round the cell like a wild beast in its cage. One thought in particular tormented him, namely that during his journey hither he had sat so still, whereas he might a dozen times have plunged into the sea, and thanks to his powers of swimming, for which he was famous, had gained the shore, concealed himself until the arrival of a Genoese or Spanish vessel, escaped to Spain or Italy, where Mercedes and his father could have joined him. He had no fears as to how he should live. Good seamen are welcome everywhere. He spoke Italian like a Tuscan and Spanish like a Castilian. He would have been free and happy with Mercedes and his father, whereas he was now confined in the Chateau d'If, that impregnable fortress, ignorant of the future destiny of his father and Mercedes. And all this because he had trusted to Villefort's promise. The thought was maddening, and Dantes threw himself furiously down on his straw. The next morning at the same hour the jailer came again. Well, said the jailer, are you more reasonable today? Dantes made no reply. Come, cheer up, is there anything that I can do for you? I wish to see the governor. I have already told you it was impossible. Why so? Because it is against prison rules, and prisoners must not even ask for it. What is allowed, then? Better fare, if you pay for it, books, and leave to walk about. I do not want books. I am satisfied with my food, and do not care to walk about. But I wish to see the governor. If you worry me by repeating the same thing, I will not bring you any more to eat. Well, then, said Edmund, if you do not, I shall die of hunger. That is all. The jailer saw by his tone he would be happy to die, and as every prisoner was worth ten sous a day to his jailer, he replied in a more subdued tone, "'What you ask is impossible, but if you are very well behaved, you will be allowed to walk about, and some day you will meet the governor, and if he chooses to reply, that is his affair.' "'But,' asked Dantes, "'how long shall I have to wait?' "'Ah, uh, a month, six months, a year. "'It is too long a time. I wish to see him at once.' "'Ah,' said the jailer, do not always brood over what is impossible, or you will be mad in a fortnight. You think so? Yes. We have an instance here. It was by always offering a million of francs to the governor for his liberty that an abbe became mad, who was in this chamber before you. How long has he left it? Two years. Was he liberated then? No, he was put in a dungeon. Listen, said Dantes, I am not an abbe. I am not mad. Perhaps I shall be, but at present, unfortunately, I am not. I will make you another offer. What is that? I do not offer you a million, because I have it not, but I will give you a hundred crowns if, the first time you go to Marseilles, you will seek out a young girl named Mercedes, at the Catalan, and give her two lines for me. If I took them and were detected, I should lose my place, which is worth two thousand francs a year, so that I should be a great fool to run such a risk for three hundred. Well, said Dantes, mark this. If you refuse at least to tell Mercedes I am here, I will some day hide myself behind the door, and when you enter I will dash out your brains with this stool. Threats, cried the jailer, retreating and putting himself on the defensive. You are certainly going mad. The abbe began like you, and in three days you will be like him, mad enough to tie up. But, fortunately, there are dungeons here. Dantes whirled the stool round his head. All right, all right, said the jailer. All right, since you will have it so, I will send word to the governor. Very well, replied Dantes, dropping the stool and sitting on it as if he were in reality mad. The jailer went out and returned in an instant with a corporal and four soldiers. By the governor's orders, said he, conduct the prisoner to the tier beneath. To the dungeon, then, said the corporal. Yes, we must put the madman with the madman. The soldiers seized Dantes, who followed passively. He descended fifteen steps, and the door of a dungeon was opened, and he was thrust in. The door closed, and Dantes advanced with outstretched hands until he touched the wall. 
He then sat down in the corner until his eyes became accustomed to the darkness. The jailer was right. Dantes wanted but little of being utterly mad. End of chapter 8 Recording by Caroline Hemmerly Kunkel, Columbus, Ohio of the Count of Monte Cristo. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Count of Monte Cristo by Alexandre Dumas. Chapter 9. The Evening of the Betrothal. Villefort had, as we have said, hastened back to Madame de saint Morin in the Place du Grand Cours and on entering the house found that the guests whom he had left at table were taking coffee in the salon rene was with all the rest of the company anxiously awaiting him and his entrance was followed by a great exclamation well decapitator guardian of the state royalist brutus what is the matter said one speak out are we threatened with a fresh reign of terror asked another has the corsican ogre broken loose cried a third marquise said villefort approaching his future mother-in-law i request your pardon for thus leaving you will the marquis honour me by a few moments private conversation ah it is really a serious matter then asked the marquis remarking the cloud on villefort's brow so serious that i must take leave of you for a few days so added he turning to rene judge for yourself if it be not important you are going to leave us cried rene unable to hide her emotion at this unexpected announcement alas returned villefort i must where then are you going asked the marquise that madame is an official secret but if you have any commissions for paris a friend of mine is going there to-night and will with pleasure undertake them the guests looked at each other you wish to speak to me alone said the marquis yes let us go to the library please the marquis took his arm and they left the salon well asked he as soon as they were by themselves tell me what it is an affair of the greatest importance that demands my immediate presence in paris now excuse the indiscretion marquis but have you any landed property all my fortune is in the funds seven or eight hundred thousand francs then sell out sell out marquis or you will lose it all but how can i sell out here you have a broker have you not yes then give me a letter to him and tell him to sell out without an instant's delay perhaps even now i shall arrive too late the deuce you say replied the marquis let us lose no time then and sitting down he wrote a letter to his broker ordering him to sell out at the market price now then said villefort placing the letter in his pocket-book i must have another to whom to the king to the king yes i dare not write to his majesty I do not ask you to write to His Majesty, but ask Monsieur de Salvieux to do so. I want a letter that will enable me to reach the King's presence without all the formalities of demanding an audience. That would occasion a loss of precious time. But address yourself to the Keeper of Seals. He has the right of entry at the Tuileries, and can procure you audience at any hour of the day or night. Doubtless, but there is no occasion to divide the honours of my discovery with him the keeper would leave me in the background and take all the glory to himself i tell you marquis my fortune is made if i only reach the tuileries the first for the king will not forget the service i do him in that case go and get ready i will call salvieux and make him write the letter be as quick as possible i must be on the road in a quarter of an hour tell your coachman to stop at the door you will present my excuses to the marquise and mademoiselle rene whom i leave on such a day with great regret you will find them both here, and can make your farewells in person. A thousand thanks, and now for the letter. The Marquis rang. A servant entered. Say to the Comte de Salvieux that I would like to see him. Now then, go, said the Marquis. I shall be gone only a few moments. Villefort hastily quitted the apartment, but reflecting that the sight of the deputy procureur running through the streets would be enough to throw the whole city into confusion, he resumed his ordinary pace at his door he perceived a figure in the shadow that seemed to wait for him it was mercedes who hearing no news of her lover had come unobserved to inquire after him as villefort drew near she advanced and stood before him dantes had spoken of mercedes and villefort instantly recognized her her beauty and high bearing surprised him and when she inquired what had become of her lover 
it seemed to him that she was the judge and he the accused the young man you speak of said villefort abruptly is a great criminal and i can do nothing for him mademoiselle mercedes burst into tears and as villefort strove to pass her again addressed him but at least tell me where he is that i may know whether he is alive or dead said she i do not know he is no longer in my hands replied villefort and desirous of putting an end to the interview he pushed by her and closed the door as if to exclude the pain he felt but remorse is not thus banished like virgil's wounded hero he carried the arrow in his wound and arrived at the salon villefort uttered a sigh that was almost a sob and sank into a chair then the first pangs of an unending torture seized upon his heart the man he sacrificed to his ambition that innocent victim immolated on the altar of his father's faults appeared to him pale and threatening leading his affianced bride by the hand and bringing with him remorse not such as the ancients figured furious and terrible but that slow and consuming agony whose pangs are intensified from hour to hour up to the very moment of death then he had a moment's hesitation he had frequently called for capital punishment on criminals and owing to his irresistible eloquence they had been condemned and yet the slightest shadow of remorse had never clouded villefort's brow because they were guilty at least he believed so but here was an innocent man whose happiness he had destroyed in this case he was not the judge but the executioner as he thus reflected he felt the sensation we have described and which had hitherto been unknown to him arise in his bosom and fill him with vague apprehensions it is thus that a wounded man trembles instinctively at the approach of the finger to his wound until it be healed but villefort's was one of those that never close or if they do only close to reopen more agonizing than ever if at this moment the sweet voice of rené had sounded in his ears pleading for mercy or the fair mercedes had entered and said in the name of god i conjure you to restore me my affianced husband his cold and trembling hands would have signed his release but no voice broke the stillness of the chamber and the door was opened only by villefort's valet who came to tell him that the travelling carriage was in readiness villefort rose or rather sprang from his chair hastily opened one of the drawers of his desk emptied all the gold it contained into his pocket stood motionless an instant his hand pressed to his head muttered a few inarticulate sounds and then perceiving that his servant had placed his cloak on his shoulders he sprang into the carriage ordering the postilions to drive to madame de saint morin the hapless dantes was doomed as the marquis had promised villefort found the marquise and rené in waiting he started when he saw rené for he fancied she was again about to plead for dantes alas her emotions were wholly personal she was thinking only of villefort's departure she loved villefort and he left her at the moment he was about to become her husband villefort knew not when he should return and rené far from pleading for dantes hated the man whose crime separated her from her lover meanwhile what of mercedes she had met fernand at the corner of the rue de la loge she had returned to the catalans and had despairingly cast herself on her couch fernand kneeling by her side took her hand and covered it with kisses that mercedes did not even feel she passed the night thus the lamp went out for want of oil but she paid no heed to the darkness and dawn came but she knew not that it was day grief had made her blind to all but one object that was edmond ah there you are said she at length turning towards fernand i have not quitted you since yesterday returned fernand sorrowfully Monsieur morel had not readily given up the fight he had learned that dantes had been taken to prison and he had gone to all his friends and the influential persons of the city but the report was already in circulation that dantes was arrested as a bonapartist agent and as the most sanguine looked upon any attempt of napoleon to remount the throne as impossible he met with nothing but refusal and had returned home in despair declaring that the matter was serious and that nothing more could be done caderousse was equally restless and uneasy but instead of seeking like m morel to aid dantes he had shut himself up with two bottles of black currant brandy in the hope of drowning reflection but he did not succeed and became too intoxicated to fetch any more drink 
and yet not so intoxicated as to forget what had happened. With his elbows on the table, he sat between the two empty bottles, while spectres danced in the light of the unsnuffed candle, spectres such as Hoffman strews over his punch-drenched pages, like black fantastic dust. Danglars alone was content and joyous. He had got rid of an enemy and made his own situation on the pharaon secure. Danglars was one of those men born with a pen behind the ear and an inkstand in the place of a heart. Everything with him was multiplication or subtraction. The life of a man was to him of far less value than a numeral, especially when, by taking it away, he could increase the sum total of his own desires. He went to bed at his usual hour and slept in peace. Villefort, after having received M. de Salvieux's letter, embraced René, kissed the Marquise's hand, and shaken that of the Marquis, started for Paris along the Aix road. Old Dantes was dying with anxiety to know what had become of Edmond. But we know very well what had become of Edmond. End of chapter 9「Of the Count of Monte Cristo. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Count of Monte Cristo by Alexander Dumas. Chapter 10. The King's Closet at the Tuileries. We will leave Villefort on the road to Paris, traveling, thanks to trebled fees, with all speed and passing through two or three apartments enter at the tuileries the little room with the arched window so well known as having been the favorite closet of napoleon and louis the eighteenth and now louis philippe there seated before a walnut table he had brought with him from hartwell and to which from one of those fancies not uncommon to great people he was particularly attached the king louis the eighteenth was carelessly listening to a man of fifty or fifty-two years of age with gray hair aristocratic bearing and exceedingly gentlemanly attire and meanwhile making a marginal note in a volume of griffius's rather inaccurate but much sought-after edition of horace a work which was much indebted to the sagacious observations of the philosophical monarch you say sir said the king that i am exceedingly disquieted sire really have you had a vision of the seven fat kine and the seven lean kine no sire for that would only be token for us seven years of plenty and seven years of scarcity and with a king as full of foresight as your majesty scarcity is not a thing to be feared then of what other scourge are you afraid my dear blaca sire i have every reason to believe that a storm is brewing in the south well my dear duke replied louis the eighteenth i think you are wrongly informed and know positively that on the contrary it is very fine weather in that direction man of ability as he was louis the eighteenth liked a pleasant jest sire continued m de blacas if it only be to reassure a faithful servant will your majesty send into languedoc provence and dauphine trusty men who will bring you back a faithful report as to the feeling in these three provinces caninus certus replied the king continuing the annotations in his horace sire replied the courtier laughing in order that he might seem to comprehend the quotation your majesty may be perfectly right in relying on the good feeling of france but i fear i am not altogether wrong in dreading some desperate attempt by whom by bonaparte or at least by his adherents my dear blaca said the king you with your alarms prevent me from working and you sire prevent me from sleeping with your security wait my dear sir wait a moment for i have such a delightful note on the pastor cuum traheret wait and i will listen to you afterwards there was a brief pause during which louis the eighteenth wrote in a hand as small as possible another note on the margin of his horace and then looking at the duke with an air of a man who thinks he has an idea of his own while he is only commenting upon the idea of another said go on my dear duke go on i listen sire said blaca who had for a moment the hope of sacrificing villefort to his own profit 
i am compelled to tell you that these are not mere rumours destitute of foundation which thus disquiet me but a serious-minded man deserving all my confidence and charged by me to watch over the south the duke hesitated as he pronounced these words has arrived by post to tell me that a great peril threatens the king and so i hasten to you sire maladucus avidomum continued louis the eighteenth still annotating does your majesty wish me to drop the subject by no means my dear duke but just stretch out your hand which whichever you please there to the left here sire i tell you to the left and you are looking to the right i mean on my left yes there you will find yesterday's report of the minister of police but here's m dandre himself and m dandre announced by the chamberlain in waiting entered come in said louis the eighteenth with a repressed smile come in baron and tell the duke all you know the latest news of m de bonaparte do not conceal anything however serious let us see the island of elba is a volcano and we may expect to have issuing thence flaming and bristling war bella horida bella m dandre leaned very respectfully on the back of a chair with his two hands and said has your majesty perused yesterday's report yes yes but tell the duke himself who cannot find anything what the report contains give him the particulars of what the usurper is doing in his islet monsieur said the baron to the duke all the servants of his majesty must approve of the latest intelligence which we have from the island of elba bonaparte monsieur dandre looked at louis the eighteenth who employed in writing a note did not even raise his head bonaparte continued the baron is mortally wearied and passes whole days in watching his miners at work at porto longon and scratches himself for amusement added the king scratches himself inquired the duke what does your majesty mean yes indeed my dear duke did you forget that this great man this hero this demigod is attacked with the malady of the skin which worries him to death perigo and moreover my dear duke continued the minister of police we are almost assured that in a very short time the usurper will be insane insane raving mad his head becomes weaker sometimes he weeps bitterly sometimes laughs boisterously at other times he passes hours on the seashore flinging stones in the water and when the flint makes duck and drake five or six times he appears as delighted as if he had gained another marengo or austerlitz now you must agree that these are indubitable symptoms of insanity or of wisdom my dear baron or of wisdom said louis the eighteenth laughing the greatest captains of antiquity amused themselves by casting pebbles into the ocean see plutarch's life of scipio africanus m de blacas pondered deeply between the confident monarch and the truthful minister villefort who did not choose to reveal the whole secret lest another should reap all the benefit of the disclosure had yet communicated enough to cause him the greatest uneasiness well well dandre said louis the eighteenth blacas is not yet convinced let us proceed therefore to the usurper's conversion the minister of police bowed the usurper's conversion murmured the duke looking at the king and dandre who spoke alternately like virgil's shepherds the usurper converted decidedly my dear duke in what way converted to good principles tell him all about it baron why this is the way of it said the minister with the gravest air in the world napoleon lately had a review and as two or three of his old veterans expressed a desire to return to france he gave them their dismissal and exhorted them to serve the good king these were his own words of that i am certain well blacas what do you think of this inquired the king triumphantly and pausing for a moment from the voluminous scholiast before him i say sire that the minister of police is greatly deceived or i am and as it is impossible it can be the minister of police as he has the guardianship of the safety and honor of your majesty it is probable that i am in error however sire if i might advise 
your majesty will interrogate the person of whom i spoke to you and i will urge your majesty to do him this honour most willingly duke under your auspices i will receive any person you please but you must not expect me to be too confiding baron have you any report more recent than this dated the twentieth february this is the fourth of march no sire but i am hourly expecting one it may have arrived since i left my office go thither and if there be none well well continued louis the eighteenth make one that is the usual way is it not and the king laughed facetiously oh sire replied the minister we have no occasion to invent any every day our desks are loaded with the most circumstantial denunciations coming from hosts of people who hope for some return for services which they seek to render but cannot they trust to fortune and rely upon some unexpected event in some way to justify their predictions well sir go said louis the eighteenth and remember that i am waiting for you i will but go and return sire i shall be back in ten minutes and i sire said monsieur de blacas will go and find my messenger wait sir wait said louis the eighteenth really monsieur de blacas i must change your armorial bearings i will give you an eagle with outstretched wings holding in its claws a prey which tries in vain to escape and bearing this device ten x sire i listen said de blacas biting his nails with impatience i wish to consult you on this passage moli fugines angelitu you know it refers to a stag flying from a wolf are you not a sportsman and a great wolf hunter well then what do you think of the moli angelitu admirable sire but my messenger is like the stag you refer to for he has posted two hundred and twenty leagues in scarcely three days which is undergoing great fatigue and anxiety my dear duke when we have a telegraph which transmits messages in three or four hours and that without getting in the least out of breath ah sire you recompense but badly this poor young man who has come so far and with so much ardour to give your majesty useful information if only for the sake of m de salvio who recommends him to me i entreat your majesty to receive him graciously m de salvio my brother's chamberlain yes sire he is at marseilles and writes me thence does he speak to you of this conspiracy no but strongly recommends m de villefort and begs me to present him to your majesty m de villefort cried the king is the messenger's name m de villefort yes sire and he comes from marseilles in person why did you not mention his name at once replied the king betraying some uneasiness sire i thought his name was unknown to your majesty no no blacas he is a man of strong and elevated understanding ambitious too and pardieu you know his father's name his father yes noirtier noirtier the girondin noirtier the senator he himself and your majesty has employed the son of such a man blaca my friend you have but limited comprehension i told you villefort was ambitious and to attain this ambition villefort would sacrifice everything even his father then sire may i present him this instant duke where is he waiting below in my carriage seek him at once i hasten to do so the duke left the royal presence with the speed of a young man his really sincere royalism made him youthful again louis the eighteenth remained alone and turning his eyes on his half-opened horse muttered justum etenisum propositi virum m de blacas returned as speedily as he had departed but in the antechamber he was forced to appeal to the king's authority villefort's dusty garb his costume which was not of courtly cut excited the susceptibility of m de bray who was all astonishment at finding that this young man had the audacity to enter before the king in such attire the duke however overcame all difficulties with a word his majesty's order 
and in spite of the protestations which the master of ceremonies made for the honor of his office and principles villefort was introduced the king was seated in the same place where the duke had left him on opening the door villefort found himself facing him and the young magistrate's first impulse was to pause come in monsieur de villefort said the king come in villefort bowed and advancing a few steps waited until the king should interrogate him monsieur de villefort said louis the eighteenth the duc de blacas assures me you have some interesting information to communicate sire the duke is right and i believe your majesty will think it equally important in the first place and before everything else sir is the news as bad in your opinion as i am asked to believe sire i believe it to be most urgent but i hope by the speed i have used that it is not irreparable speak as fully as you please sir said the king who began to give way to the emotion which had showed itself in blacas's face and affected villefort's voice speak sir and pray begin at the beginning i like order in everything sire said villefort i will render a faithful report to your majesty but i must entreat your forgiveness if my anxiety leads to some obscurity in my language a glance at the king after this discreet and subtle exordium assured villefort of the benignity of his august auditor and he went on sire i have come as rapidly to paris as possible to inform your majesty that i have discovered in the exercise of my duties not a commonplace and insignificant plot such as is every day got up in the lower ranks of the people and in the army but an actual conspiracy a storm which menaces no less than your majesty's throne sire the usurper is arming three ships he meditates some project which however mad is yet perhaps terrible at this moment he will have left elba to go whither i know not but assuredly to attempt a landing either at naples or on the coast of tuscany or perhaps on the shores of france your majesty is well aware that the sovereign of the island of elba has maintained his relations with italy and france i am sir said the king much agitated and recently we have had information that the bonapartist clubs have had meetings in the rue st jacques but proceed i beg of you how did you obtain these details sire they are the results of an examination which i have made of a man of marseilles whom i have watched for some time and arrested on the day of my departure this person a sailor of turbulent character and whom i suspected of bonapartism has been secretly to the island of elba there he saw the grand marshal who charged him with an oral message to a bonapartist in paris whose name i could not extract from him but this mission was to prepare men's minds for a return it is the man who says this sire a return which will soon occur and where is this man in prison sire and the matter seems serious to you so serious sire that when the circumstance surprised me in the midst of a family festival on the very day of my betrothal i left my bride and friends postponing everything that i might hasten to lay at your majesty's feet the fears which impressed me and the assurance of my devotion true said louis the eighteenth was there not a marriage engagement between you and mademoiselle de saint moran daughter of one of your majesty's most faithful servants yes yes but let us talk of this plot monsieur villefort sire i fear it is more than a plot i fear it is a conspiracy a conspiracy in these times said louis the eighteenth smiling is a thing very easy to meditate but more difficult to conduct to an end inasmuch as re-established so recently on the throne of our ancestors we have our eyes open at once upon the past the present and the future for the last ten months my ministers have redoubled their vigilance in order to watch the shores of the mediterranean if bonaparte landed at naples the whole coalition would be on foot before he could even reach piumoino if he land in tuscany he will be in an unfriendly territory if he land in france it must be with a handful of men and the result of that is easily foretold execrated as he is by the population take courage sir but at the same time rely on our royal gratitude ah here is monsieur d'andre cried de blacas 
at this instant the minister of police appeared at the door pale trembling and as if ready to faint villefort was about to retire but m de blacas taking his hand restrained him End of chapter 10